Hello, and welcome to this ISA Global Cybersecurity Alliance webinar. My name is Matthew, and I'll be your Global Spec Moderator, and I want to review a few housekeeping items with you before we begin. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the operation of the user interface for today's webinar. The large window with the heading presentation in the upper left is the primary window for today's session. Just to the right of the main presentation window is the speaker bio window with background information on today's presenters. Just below that is the Q&A window. At any time during the presentation, you can enter a question into the box in the lower section of the window and click Submit. Your question will be placed in the queue to address when we get to the Q&A session. At the bottom of your screen, you will see additional buttons to enhance your webinar experience. To see what a particular button does, just place your mouse pointer over it and a tooltip will appear with a description of the button's function. Now let me introduce today's presenters. With us today is Andre Ristino. Andre is the Managing Director, Global Consortia Conformity Assessment at the International Society of Automation. And joining Andre is Brian Peterson. Brian is the ICS for ICS Program Manager, Logic Program Manager, and ISA GCA Advocacy Program Manager. To read more about our presenters, please look at the speaker bio window right next to the main presentation window. And guys, welcome to today's event. And with that, I will pass things along to you to get started. Thank you, Matthew. So uh, this is Andre Restaino, uh, Managing Director at ISA. Just a brief uh, introduction about who ISA is and, uh, and how we came to uh, start up this uh, ICS for ICS. And I'll turn it over to, uh, to uh, Brian, my program manager. The ISA is the International Society of Automation. We're a professional engineering society focused in the domain of uh, automation engineering. We have about 38,000 members. We're an international society with 135 sections in 44 countries. Uh, we do a lot of events, education, training, uh, webinars, and uh, we touch about 350,000 or more customers a year. Last year, we trained over 3,000 professionals in the automation engineering arena, including training on the 62443 uh, International Cybersecurity Standards. So we are an uh, ANSI accredited standards development organization. We've published over 150 standards in our 75 years of existence. A key standard that uh, makes us relevant in the cybersecurity space is the ISA IEC 62443 series of standards purpose built for securing OT uh, operational technology automation and control systems that affect our everyday lives. So, um, so ISA stood up uh, in 2019 an organization uh, called um, ISA Global Cybersecurity Alliance. Its uh, objective is to advocate for uh, best practices in cybersecurity for operational technology, these automation and control systems uh, that uh, are in critical infrastructure like water, wastewater, transportation, uh, uh, power generation, distribution, oil and gas, pipelines, et cetera. And uh, our practices and what we promote and train on and develop uh, um, materials for adoption are revolve around the ISA IEC 62443 series of standards. These standards uh, are international. They've recently been formally recognized as uh, technical horizontal standards by the IEC, which means that as uh, industry sectors develop um, cybersecurity requirements in their uh, specifications, they're, direct, they're directed to use the 62443 standards as opposed to attempting to develop them from scratch. So uh, we have uh, established training and certification programs for professionals uh, around the 62443 standards. Uh, we're uh, doing the advocacy and outreach, um, again, you know, to promote the use of the standards. Uh, we have experience in managing consortia. I'm running four myself right now. And um, yeah, so the ISA GCA is 
uh, under uh, the umbrella of ISA. So a little, a little bit uh, more just of, about the ISA Global Cybersecurity Alliance. You know, we do collaboration with other industry groups, um, and uh, we promote standards. We're um, putting together uh, gaps, identifying gaps both from the product supplier side and the end user side for um, developing education um, to uh, promote the use of uh, good practices, good cyber practices, good cyber hygiene based on the standards. Our objective is to elevate uh, OT cybersecurity from a science to, from an art to a science to an engineering discipline similar to safety, which so 50 years ago. So uh, that's it for the introduction. Uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, listen to the about ISA and the ISA GCA, and I'm going to turn it over to Brian, and uh, he'll provide uh, an overview and answer questions on the industrial controls and incident command system for industrial controls. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, so I work for Andre, and I'm helping manage this program, bringing together a bot uh, many volunteers who are helping to develop the program, and I'll share with you um, some of the information we have. Okay, so um, we know that we're having cybersecurity threats um, all over the world, and we've had some significant events. They're threatening industry sectors, they're threatening governments, and the reason it's so important is um, industrial control systems are used uh, to manage many of the aspects of our daily lives. They manage the energy that we receive, electricity, oil, gas, water, the buildings that we work in, uh, travel, our rail systems and stoplights all rely on control systems, and many other aspects of our lives are impacted by um, industrial control systems being disrupted from cybersecurity incidents. So we've got lots of threats happening and lots of incidents happening. So we, many of us are familiar with the Colonial Pipeline. It was a major event that disrupted uh, the supply chain in the East Coast of the United States, and people couldn't get gasoline, and gasoline prices soared astronomically. Uh, regrettably, they didn't have ICS for ICS, um, so their response was uh, fairly poor and did not resolve the problem quickly. So we've got lots of opportunity to improve our response, and ICS for ICS, we believe, is, is the solution to help improve the response to these various incidents and threats that are impacting um, our lives and our industries around the world. So what ICS for ICS is doing is bringing together three proven disciplines. We've got incident command system. It's a structured approach to managing various types of incidents. It's been used widely for oil spills offshore. It's been used for fire, earthquake, uh, various things. It's been around since the 1970s and it's widely used and it's, it's a proven methodology uh, that FEMA provides and many governments around the world have also adopted um, either, FEMA, either that FEMA model or modified it slightly or they've adopted their own model which is very similar. We've got cybersecurity people in each of our companies that, that help us respond. They often are part of a computer incident response team, might not be called that exactly, but that's what they are. They do investigation and they monitor all of our systems um, from an IT perspective, and they do initial response to those. Uh, they're receiving millions, in some cases, uh, per day for a large company, a uh, number of events that are occurring. They have to whittle that down to something that looks like it might be a real threat. And that's what they do for a living. The industrial control system folks uh, have proven capabilities. Um, they're the front line. They're going to see disruptions in our control systems that might disrupt our critical infrastructure. And they bring expertise that's specific to their industrial control system and their business that they're in. And often they work closely with the computer incident response team to try to get resolution of incidents that are occurring. So just to dive a little more into this, um, so the incident command system, as I mentioned, came from FEMA, and uh, we leveraged materials from DHS as well. And it provides a structured approach with 
roles and responsibilities being defined, procedures and processes that got great tools and templates, and lots of great material that help us get organized and have a, a leveraging a large group of people within our company to get this um, incident resolved quickly. We've got first responders in many industries who are already familiar with uh, the incident command system and they use it uh, to manage these various other types of incidents. So we're seeking to have everyone in, that, in all of the companies use the same incident command system to manage cybersecurity incidents. It just seems uh, a natural fit. So our cybersecurity people, we've got lots of very bright people in the IT organization and they do a great job. They, like I said, they're monitoring a lot of activity happening in the company, seven by 24, and they do initial response, they investigate, and they take initial steps to try to minimize the impact of incidents. The industrial control system people, their operation technology people, um, you know, they're wide seven by 24 as well, operating whatever assets and systems using control systems, and they're likely going to be the first people that see abnormalities that suggest that their systems have been compromised. They're likely going to immediately work with the cybersecurity folks, the uh, computer incident response team, to try to understand. And then ultimately, those two groups are going to escalate to uh, the incident command system staff, which would be senior level people who are going to make a decision around um, what the next steps are to manage this uh, event that has occurred and determine and declare a potentially that an actual incident, a full-blown incident has occurred. So um, just some of the benefits, there's many benefits. You know, we have one process with ICS for ICS and it transcends the individual companies and the people over time. It allows a large group of diverse people who might not be in the same company to work together. And that's really the key to the value of this. So it combines those uh, three elements that are each proven individually into one process and one methodology. Uh, we've leveraged uh, the materials from FEMA, DHS, um, including their exercise materials, their tools, templates, and resources, which are part of the National Incident Management System. Um, and many people around the world, many governments around the world have also adopted something very similar. Many of them have used FEMA's materials to create their own incident command system for their country. Um, they have the one responder system. It allows us to do credentialing. So we want to ensure that people obtain the right training and have the right skills and experience to be able to perform the various roles um, that are needed to help us to expedite resolution of cybersecurity incidents that impact industrial control systems. And so we're going to use that system to do that. And we've got a queue of people interested in obtaining credentials and they're going to use those, those skills and abilities within their own company to help uh, manage incidents in their own company. And then more broadly, uh, if there's um, opportunities for mutual aid. So if you don't have the right resources in your company, particularly small and medium companies might not have some of the resources uh, available. So there can be mutual aid agreements and ICS for ICS helps facilitate that. And you can potentially hire third party cybersecurity experts to help you and a mutual aid agreement helps uh, expedite that, get it done quickly so you can get the incident resolved. Um, it also allows potential mutual aid between industry sector competitors who might use the resources to help each other, particularly in remote locations around the world. So mutual aid is going to be a, a really valuable thing for lots of companies. Coordinating response uh, among multiple entities. So if, you know, we, right now we're focused on a single company but potentially we could have a sector wide. Maybe all of the electrical companies in a region or around the world are all impacted by a similar uh, threat, a similar uh, malware event. And essentially those people need to work together to solve that problem. Often that's being led by government agencies uh, like uh, DHS's uh, Critical Infrastructure Security Agency and other countries have a similar equivalent to that and they're providing information, they're providing knowledge and solutions to help people resolve that. And we also have vendors who a specific vendor product might have been impacted and been targeted. So the real value of ICS for ICS is if we have a broad, either global or regional or industry sector event occur, we can all collaborate together because we all have one 
common process and one common capability to get this thing resolved as quickly as possible. So this is an org chart, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but essentially at the top you can see there's a unified command. We are focused often, and we're talking today about cybersecurity, but potentially that cybersecurity event could have caused a physical event. There could have been a fire resulting from the cybersecurity attack. Um, someone could have opened a valve and spilled chemicals or products all over the ground. So potentially this unified command would be managing both a cybersecurity uh, event at the same time addressing the physical, cleaning the spill, put the fire out, get our business back to operations. So we have some support people. There's a public information officer. All the communications need to come from that person and go outside the company. We don't want people communicating. It creates liability and risk for the company. It can be disastrous uh, from your uh, market cap uh, perspective. Companies that have had poor communications have seen their value of their company decline radically. We have legal counsel who's directly attached to this organization to help give advice on the spot immediately. We have a safety officer who ensures the safety of this team as well as the overall company and all of its staff and its operations. We might have multiple liaison officers. One might be uh, interfacing with the FBI and other law enforcement agencies. Another liaison officer might be uh, liaising with uh, people like our stakeholders. Could be a joint venture operation and we need to communicate to those people and keep them aware of what's going on. And then you have the section chiefs and they're all working. The, one to the far left operations section, that probably is somebody who's uh, part of that computer incident response team, probably a senior person, manager, director, whatever. And they have a team, and they're going to form the appropriate team as needed. So they'll pick the individuals that they need based on the actual incident. So you might not have certain components that were impacted. You don't need those roles then. And then the, the team may form into sub-teams, which is really these branches, division, and group, to work on and solve specific problems depending on the, the magnitude of the, of the incident. And the intel uh, an analyst is going to provide intelligence. They'd probably be working with the DHS organization and with others, the vendors, to understand the intelligence information that they can get and feed into that organization to get this thing resolved quickly. You may or may not need each of these other section chiefs. You decide based on the scope and magnitude of the incident. But the planning section chief is really very important because that person does a lot of work that prepares materials that the operations section chief and organization can use. Those people are very busy. They're very, very busy, so they need help. And this individual and his organization, his or her organization, provide that assistance to get the materials and information together. Uh, logistics section ensures, for example, that we have food. Um, if the event or the incident disrupted the operations of our IT systems or communications, they make sure that we have an alternative work location. So this team can function. Administration and finance section, you may need procurement. Often you need procurement. So if you have a third party that you need to help you and you don't have a contract, Procurement will help establish that contract, likely with the assistance of the legal counsel. Uh, insurance claims are critical. Many of the insurance policies require that the insurance company be notified immediately upon an incident occurring once it's declared an incident. And so that this organization would, would liaise with the insurance company as well as do cost and time management. It's important uh, to be able to track and account for all the time and resources being spent. And... Um, in addition to that, uh, you would use it for insurance claims, you'd use it for financial reporting at the end of the year. You need to understand the magnitude of that. So there's lots of good reasons to use an instant command system. Like I said, it's already widely used. It's proven, it's effective, the standard approach is used by lots of people. It has a predictable chain of command so people know where they fit into the organization. That's very important that people understand where they fit and they know their role and responsibility and what their span of control is, the limits of what their span of control is and who makes decisions. So this process of ICS for ICS helps ensure that we can quickly make decisions because we know who's making those decisions, which parties are involved, who's providing the data, 
data to make those decisions. Um, common terminology, which would allow us to work with third parties in a mutual aid situation or address a wider, broader um, incident that might impact industries around the world. Um, and then we have a, 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 the ability to deal with planned and both unplanned incidents and events. Um, we have a coordinated response, and this is the most important thing, is to get a coordinated response so you get the thing solved and you get back to your business. You get back to whatever it is you do for a living and the services that you provide become available again. And so there's this common process and there's accountability. So lots of good things. So this planning P, I just wanted to briefly talk about. So planning P is, is, is the flowchart of, and the methodology. And what it does is it helps us understand how we do the individual steps and how we collect data and how we make decisions. I mean, that's most important. While some of this stuff is going on um, with uh, meetings and all that, the teams are still working. The, the individual teams are still doing their job. So the computer incident response team is still responding and taking actions based on the direction of their manager, supervisor, who's participating in these incident command meetings. Um, same with the industrial control staff. They're all still doing their job and taking action, but this, methodology helps make the decisions and collect the information to most effectively manage an incident. So um, the um, meeting structure often is set up on an hour and a half to two hour cycle where the people meet and they ensure that all the data is collected and we'll talk about some of the forms that are helping guide us to understand what kind of data we need to collect, who collects that data, and how we make decisions. So when this incident first starts, it's called an event. And the reason it's called an event is because only authorized people in the company have the authority to declare an incident because of all the implications. There's governmental reporting, there's insurance implications, financial commitment. So initially, the people in the, in the ground level who are in a computer incident response team or the um, industrial control team, they're identifying an event and they're escalating to somebody who can declare that an event uh, it actually becomes an incident who has the authority in the company. And they're going to do notification both to the executive leadership team, the C-suite, right? The CEO, CFO, CIO, all those C people need to know that we've declared an incident. They don't want to hear about it on the, on the news. They want to be told what's happening and be apprised. Uh, there's an initial response and assessment that's done, and a briefing filled out, a briefing document filled out, which is probably a couple paragraphs initially. Whatever data we have available about the incident is, is uh, shared, and uh, we have an initial uh, unified command meeting, and we get started. So people have been called to come forward and participate in these meetings, and as we move forward, we'll add more people potentially, uh, depending on the initial assessment. So what this slide helps us understand is there's lots of forms, and the forms aren't there to be forms. They're there to help guide our thinking. Um, if you've been involved in incident response, you get called at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're not at your best. You're not uh, in your clearest mind. And so what happens is we fill out some of these forms and we get used to it during exercises, periodic exercises, maybe yearly or twice a year. And we walk through filling out these forms and understanding how we would respond. So one of the critical forms is this uh, 213RR, which is our resource request. So the team within that operations section says, I need resources. The other organizations, the other section chiefs, go off and get me those resources, right? Uh, that's what the value of this is. We agree on who we need. Uh, we do some tactical meetings, and we have, like I said, periodic schedule of maybe every 90 minutes to every two hours where we, we get together and as a leadership team, we talk about what's the current status and what needs to be, what needs to happen next. So there's some tactical meetings, there's some planning meetings, and we're using these forms to help guide us and to understand who provides the data, who makes the decision, and it's that uh, ability to understand who's in charge and how we'll make uh, decisions and so we don't um, have paralysis. Often in incidents, uh, the biggest problem you have is people don't collect the right data, so they can't make the decision. And even if you have the right data, 
nobody knows who's responsible for making the decision. So there's a clear line of authority and the forms that are here in red help guide you to say which data, what data do I need to collect and who's going to make the decision so we can move forward and not, not get stuck. So I just wanted to share with you some of the future activities that we've got going on in ICS for ICS. So our initial version is a type three incident. It's a single company and it's a single site, single asset that's being impacted by the incident. So we started there, pretty easy to deal with that. That's a type three. What we're working on now is a type two. So this would be one company, multiple assets all over the world potentially. And so it's gonna add some more layers and a little more complexity and ultimately, hopefully in the next, uh, later this year or early next year, we'll do an exercise around the type two. Right now we're focused on type three. Uh, we have uh, credentialing. We're working on finalizing our credentialing process using all the FEMA resources, that one responder system. And we've developed some training and most of the training will, is coming from FEMA. So they provide great training that's very applicable to any kind of incident. And we've developed uh, one course right now, an overview course, as well as developed, we're in the process of putting together a workshop. And so those will be part of that credentialing process to train. And we, we have a, a adjudication committee that decides who gets credentialed and what they would need to do to be able to obtain the appropriate credentials within all those roles we had on that org chart I just showed you a few minutes ago. So we're gonna conduct an exercise right now because of the pandemic, our exercise got delayed. We should have had it a couple weeks ago, but uh, we're gonna have it now on April 18th, and we're gonna do it in Miami at S4, which is a premier cybersecurity incident uh, industrial control system event. And um, we have people can attend for free. We have uh, some expert level people on this first exercise who are gonna fill those roles who've done um, cybersecurity roles, into the command roles, industrial uh, control system roles, and we're going to videotape it. And by May 1st, it'll be available for everyone to view. And then we're working with various people to have them host um, an exercise. So we have identified several countries that have already said, yes, I want to do an exercise. It's about a three-hour exercise, so it's not a trivial commitment, but they're going to help put together and assemble a team similar to what we're doing on April 18th in their country or their industry sector. And they're gonna find uh, an event similar to S4 to, to host that exercise so that a broad audience of people who are either in the incident command space, cybersecurity space, or industrial control system space can attend and really see the value of ICS for ICS. I, I think once that video is available, it will really help drive home the value and benefit of using um, ICS for ICS to manage these, these uh, incidents. So what can you do? How can you get involved? Um, so um, Matt will talk more about the, the resource panel where there's some links in there. You can register for our newsletter. So you can express interest in ICS for ICS. We'll add to your newsletter. We have got a monthly newsletter. And we share what's going on and let you know what's happening and we'll be putting in events that are happening all over the world. So maybe you want to attend one of them. Some of them are virtual, some of them are in person. Um, you ultimately could observe and participate in an exercise either in person or on the video, and there'll be some virtual ones. You could host your own exercise at a public event or even within your company, and we will help you uh, provide you resources um, and some assistance to help you do that. Uh, you can join the ICS for ICS team. So we have a, a process team. We've got people who are helping put together the processes that go into the exercise and help um, provide all the exercise materials, job aids, all of that kind of stuff around the process of ICS for ICS. We have training that you can take. So we have an overview course, a uh, couple hours broken into modules. So you can take the modules of interest to you. And we're putting together a workshop training course um, that will be out in, a, in probably about three weeks. Um, in addition to that, we have an awareness and outreach team. You're welcome to join that. And we help identify the people who are going to actually host the exercises, the people who are going to present at different events and help really ensure that ICS for ICS is, um, is communicated broadly to uh, anyone who's interested and we're you know, very happy to share information about ICS for ICS. We'll find a speaker 
And ultimately, you could become a speaker. You could present on ICS for ICS. We have people volunteering uh, to speak in their country or in their industrial sector at an event, whether it's virtual or in person, and you're welcome to do so. So uh, thank you very much. And Matt, I'll turn it back over to you for questions and answers. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Brian. That was such a great presentation. Thank you so much for that. And um, to the audience, uh, we are uh, moving into the Q&A session in a moment. Uh, we do have some great questions sitting in the queue, so we're going to get to those. Uh, but if you're thinking of any more, uh, now is your opportunity to submit them. You can enter them in the uh, Q&A box and click Submit. And we'll try to answer as many as we can uh, before the close of the session. And while you're thinking of your questions, uh, Brian had mentioned there's some additional uh, resources available. Um, so on your screen, the top right corner in the resource list, um, all that information that Brian had mentioned is available. You can simply click on the appropriate link and uh, follow through. I'm sure the team would love to hear from you, so please get in touch. Um, in addition to questions, if you have any uh, stories, some stories about an incident response or something um, that you have experienced, we'd love to hear about that as well. Please send that stuff in. Let's keep this conversation going. All right, let's see what we have in the queue. Okay, here's our first question for today. Um, okay, uh, when will the next version of ICS for ICS be available and what capabilities will be included? Right? Yeah, great. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, so what we're going to be doing is um, we're going to take some of the mutual aid information that's currently available from FEMA and from others, and we're going to further develop that. So we're hoping to have a, a standard template contract that people can use. Uh, it's critical that people engage with third parties, in particular that are paid services. We have lots of uh, very valuable companies that provide intel that you might need. Uh, maybe you don't have a forensics person and you have an incident and you desperately need one. Uh, so we're going to work on mutual aid. Uh, we're going to add a layer that will address what happens if your IT capabilities and systems are down. They were also impacted by the incident. And how will that work as far as establishing an alternative site and alternative communications and, and allow the ICS for ICS team to work? Um, we're also going to move on to um, Type 2, which will be one company, multiple assets within that company. And so that adds a layer of complexity as well that um, will be valuable for companies because, you know, often uh, incidents can spread uh, across an entire enterprise, a single company. Um, so those are the things we're working on that are the main items, and we hope to have an exercise by the end of the year or possibly by by February next year of that type two, and then we'll start working on uh, the type one, which is a you know sector wide, country wide, or global incident after that, which would be in the subsequent year, about a year after that. Oh, very cool stuff. Thank you for that. And thank you to the audience member for sending that question. That's a great question. Uh, and we have a lot more in here that look great, but if you are thinking of any, please send them in and we'll try to get to them. All right, here's the next question. I'm really happy someone had, uh, asked this because this is something I was wondering. Uh, how will the ICS for ICS program ensure that government agencies throughout the world can align with and leverage these processes? That's, yeah, great. Um, so what we've done is we have a list of almost a thousand people on our uh, uh, interested parties list that get the newsletter, and we started engaging them um, often by country. And part of uh, what we're doing is engaging the governmental agency. So in the U.S., it's straightforward. Uh, um, we have DHS, Critical Infrastructure Security Agency, who's responsible for most of the coordination of cybersecurity incidents. Um, they are a founding member of, of this, as well as many of the people participate, and also FEMA uh, participates, and then some other groups within DHS that, that also are knowledgeable. We're doing the same thing, uh, for example, in Australia. So they have an equivalent of, of that DHS group, and they are actually going to participate in the exercise. So we're trying to ensure that each country we engage for an exercise includes the governmental agency equivalent to DHS, and we were hoping, and in some cases we do have people helping influence the design of ICS for ICS so that it'll work in each of those countries. We're trying to do one process and then limited 
customization per country or, or industry sector as needed. Um, but we do have quite a few government people on that distribution list of a thousand people and they're paying attention. They're, they're interested. Um, they want to be involved and they're looking for a common process like ICS for ICS provides. Excellent. Thank you for that. And uh, just to the audience, we are in the Q&A session. Uh, you can still submit your question by entering it in the Q&A box and clicking Submit. And we had a few questions come in uh, asking about uh, if a replay will be available. I just wanted to answer that. Uh, the replay will be available uh, about one hour after today's session ends, and you can come back and watch it using the same link you used today. Okay, here's our next question. Um, now, this was mentioned, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and submit the question uh, anyway. It's not, not a bad idea to, to remind folks. Um, the question is, uh, how can I get involved or obtain more information about ICS for ICS? Brian? Great. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so that resource window has links to uh, help you get to our on our distribution list and provides a page of information about ICS for ICS. We are rewriting our website, making it um, much more robust. It also, there's a link in there to uh, sign up for S4. Even if you can't attend in person, you can still sign up and we'll ensure you get the video. Um, and then there's a link in there for volunteering. And we are critically dependent on volunteers. This is a volunteer army almost completely. And we've had uh, fabulous volunteers uh, that have helped us shape and design ICS for ICS. So we would greatly appreciate um, more people getting involved. If you're not interested in, in, and don't have the time right now to get involved, at least join our newsletter. And then you can sort of see what's happening. And we're hoping, um, you know, that multiple companies around the world um, take on this process and do an exercise in their own company and see the value of it. I think after you see the video that's coming out on May 1st of the, of the first exercise, you'll see some real value and that may, may drive you to want to um, do some more work in your industry sector or in your company. Absolutely. That's all positive stuff. That's great. Okay. And we have a couple more questions in the queue, uh, but if you guys do have any more left, please send them in now. Um, we still have a little while to go, but we'll try to answer them. Uh, okay. Here's our next question, a bit of a follow-up about getting involved here. Uh, what support will the I, ICS for ICS program provide to local people who want to host exercises? That's a great question. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we, we are um, putting all of our materials on our website. We're, like I said, revising the website to be more complex so we can do that. So we'll have all the tools and templates, blank forms, uh, documentation, job aids, everything. Um, we'll also have all the credentialing materials out there um, along with training. So how do I get credentialed and what training can I take um, that would help me be effective in, in that exercise that we were discussing. And then we'll have a separate page on exercises. So we'll have um, the playbooks, all of the materials uh, that would be needed by the exercise team to be able to, to perform and uh, host an exercise within your company or within your sector. And so we're putting lots of materials out on the website. And then, of course, the team is there to help, um, you know, provide some support to get you started. And we're still working that out as far as what level of support we think people will need. We've got five countries right now that are ready to go. Uh, as soon as the um, exercise happens on April 18th, they're going to look for a public event they're first going to do public events and then they'll move on to their company after that. Um, so they're doing that and we're going to test those materials that we have on our website. And if they don't work well, if there's more materials needed, we'll provide those. Whatever we need to do, we're going to ensure that there's a successful deployment and rollout of, of uh, these capabilities so people can do exercises all over the world. Because the exercise is really the proof. It's, it's the proof of the value of the, of the process and people who might be incident command people may not have a lot of knowledge about cybersecurity and industrial control and vice versa. So the exercise brings all those people together in one place to do one exercise and see, ah, I see the value of this, and that's what we're driving towards. Oh, that's great. A lot of support coming from the team. Wonderful to hear. Okay, and 
Uh, looks like we have one last question in the queue, but before we get to that, just want to last mention to the audience, uh, now is your chance, your final chance to submit your questions, if you have any, or if you have a story about an incident response or something you may have experienced that's related, we'd love to hear about that too. Please feel free to send that in. All right, but for now, uh, this is our last question. Um, okay, and here it is. Oh, it's a good one. Uh, I believe you may have briefly mentioned this, Brian, but I'm going to go ahead and ask the question anyway, just to reinforce it. Uh, and here it is. How can I obtain uh, ICS for ICS credentials? Great question, Matt. Um, so we are working to finalize our first pilot, uh, first person going through the credentialing process, and uh, we are using one responder, which is provided by FEMA. It can be used globally. Um, we sort of have to trick the system a little bit by putting a U.S. address in, but we just have been using uh, ISA's uh, home office address. Uh, as the as the address, and essentially we're going to be ready probably in about three weeks to open the door to everybody, and we'll share the information. Um, there's less than 20 hours of training required to obtain uh, a Type 4 credential with any one of those roles that I, I mentioned on the organization chart. So um, if you want to join the newsletter, you'll be getting more information about uh, credentialing and the training. Uh, we have about 20 people who are almost done with the training, uh, about half of them, about 10, of them, 10 or 12 of them are done, and they are ready to be credentialed. And like I said, we're going through our first one uh, with, with the, the FEMA one responder system, and once we get that person credentialed, because there's an adjudication committee that also has steps they have to do, which is approve the credentials. And then over the long term, we hope to uh, establish adjudication committees outside of the U.S., uh, for now, we're using the U.S.-based adjudication committee that approves credentials, but in the long term, there'll probably be one in Europe, uh, maybe at least one or two in Asia, and so we'll distribute the responsibility for for approving the credentials uh, globally. Uh, but right now, we have a lot of U.S. people and a smaller number of uh, people outside the U.S., so we're using the U.S. process. But yeah, we're ready to go in about three weeks. Our next newsletter, hopefully, will be the announcement so please join the newsletter. Excellent. Thank you for that. And as mentioned, um, those resource links are on your on your screen on the top right corner, including the newsletter. Uh, so please feel free to access that information. You can also come back and watch the replay, and that information will also be available for you. Okay, and let's take one last look at the queue. Okay, and it looks like that was our last question. Uh, so we are going to wrap things up right there. Uh, so, Brian, thank you so much for that great presentation and also taking the time to answer some questions from the audience. I'd like to also thank our audience members for being part of this webinar event. You will be receiving an email from us, like mentioned, uh, with a link to the on-demand version of this presentation so you can come back and watch it again or share it with your colleagues. And lastly, please take a moment to complete a survey which will appear on your screen at the end of this live webinar. For on-demand viewers, you will find the survey located along the bottom of your attendee console in the survey widget. Again, thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar event. Take care, and we'll talk with you soon.